Welcome to the Therapy Show Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard. In each episode, I interview a seasoned and knowledgeable talk therapist from the counseling world to glean valuable insights, techniques, and tools that you can apply to your practice and your life. And if you're considering a career in the counseling field or just want to hear about what it's like to be a talk therapist, then this is the podcast for you. This week's episode is all about interpersonal violence, also known as IPV. And my guest, Kelly Lynch, is going to share with us statistics on IPV, the emotional and physical impacts related to IPV, understanding our therapeutic role when working with someone who has experienced IPV, and she's going to share why psychoeducation on this topic is really important for the therapist as well as the client. Here's a little bit you should know about Kelly. She is a LCSW, EMT, CPT, PN level one. What does all that mean? She's a licensed clinical social worker, emergency medical technician, certified life coach, certified fitness trainer, and certified nutrition coach. She owns two businesses, a private life coaching practice, The Unapology Project, and a private psychotherapy practice, Turning Point Wellness. She has 10 years of experience as an EMT, and over 11 years in experience in helping guide people into a space of realizing and unlocking their greatest potential. Her clinical experience is diverse, including working with children, families, and people with severe and persistent mental health disorders and substance addictions. She has contributed to the development of multiple emergency services programs, clinical programs, and education curriculums for emergency services personnel and clinical therapists, as well as taught these programs. Kelly specializes in trauma-related disorders and teaches her clients how to define what it means to live life on their terms by being in control of themselves, the choices they make, and taking the best possible care of themselves. And we hope you find value in this week's episode. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Therapy Show. I'm your host, Lisa Mustard, and I have a very special guest on today's show. Today, we're going to talk about domestic violence and Kelly Lynch. I'm going to allow her to introduce herself because I always feel like the guests do it best when I, I say, can you describe to the audience who you are and who you help? So welcome to the show, Kelly. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. and Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So tell us a little bit about like your background, how this topic became, you know, something that you're passionate about, because I know that it's near and dear to your heart. Sure. Absolutely. So I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Connecticut, and I actually own two practices. I own a private psychotherapy practice called Turning Point Wellness, but then I also own a private coaching practice called The Unapology Project, where I specialize in working with women who are coming out of really traumatic and difficult stages and phases in their lives and are looking to work on reconstructing their identity and get back a sense of really the just the queen that they are. Mm. A lot of the work that I find I end up doing in my coaching practice is with survivors of domestic violence because I am one. So this is really why this topic is so close to my heart of just understanding through the personal experience what it means to be able to overcome mm -hmm. or not just overcome, but also recover from the trauma and then overcome to be able to go on and live really as cliche as it sounds with how much this saying is used in our society today, your best life. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, cool. Well, I like that. And I'm so grateful that you're here today and you're willing to share your background and experiences. Can you share with the listeners how you got into social work? So you have a background in something different. And then I'm curious, mm -hmm. the domestic violence that you witnessed, was that prior to becoming a social worker? Or where is the timeline and all of this. I'm just really kind of curious about that. Yeah. So it all kind of gels together that it truly, it was all kind of happening at the same time. So prior to becoming a social worker, I was actually an EMT. Mm -hmm. So I worked in emergency services for a grand total of 10 years and I'm still certified as an EMT, but I haven't been on the road since or on an ambulance since 2012 when I got pregnant with my daughter. Mm -hmm. I got into EMS after 9-11 happened. And I just, I had this urgency internally that I just felt like I needed to do something. Mm -hmm. And I had tried to join the military, but I have a bad back. I've got some hardware in my back. So the military said, thanks, but no thanks. 
And I had to figure out, well, what else was even going to be an option? So EMS became a thing. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And that's how I met my ex-husband. We were partners on the ambulance. And so I was going to school as I was in EMS, I was going to school to become a social worker because I just kind of figured out through EMS that I was good with people and liked being a helper. Mm -hmm. And this cycle of abuse and the escalation of abuse happened pretty quickly on in our relationship. So EMS, then I'll say social work school, and then the domestic violence started. Okay. Okay. So I'm just kind of curious if you don't mind, I like to kind of dig a little bit because I'm just really curious. Yeah. yeah. Did you recognize that it was domestic violence or did you kind of like, how did you come to the realization that what you were experiencing was not normal or healthy? It took such a long time. Okay. So at, at first it was truly a conversation of, I just didn't know mm-hmm. and, or I didn't know any better. And then when I did know better, I chose to look past it. You know, I, I did the very stereotypical well, I can change him. Mm. I can help him. He has a lousy history and I can love him through it. And this is such a common narrative for women and men at times too, Mm. coming out of these violent relationships where it's truly at first, you don't know any better or you don't recognize it. And then the second that you do recognize it is now you're pushing it to one side saying, I can fix it. Right. One of the biggest things which we can get more into Mm -hmm. kind of as we're talking, but one of the biggest things that I, in my own process of recovery, really had to take a hard, very raw look at was my cycle of codependency, lack of boundaries, and really being in a very enmeshed relationship. And that I realized over the process of my own therapy came out of what I watched as a child. You know, not that I had a traumatic childhood, but I definitely watched unhealthy relationships play out. Right. So I did what I knew. It doesn't excuse it, but it does explain it. And that's really where the process of recovery begins. That so we don't want to excuse anything, mm-hmm. but we do want to try to explain it so that we can understand it and grow from it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. I was, I'm just, you know, having that background and knowing your process and understanding your journey, I think mm-hmm. really helps kind of set the tone and the pace for our conversation today sure. and knowing that you've, you've lived through it and you've been through the cycle and let's kind of talk a little bit first about the statistics yeah. on incident of intimate partner violence and domestic violence. Well, before we do that, would you define partner violence, domestic violence? Are they the same? Or are they, you know, does one replace the other terminology? Mm-hmm. So in terms of terminology, what's happened is that the National Coalition on Domestic Violence has realized that to be in more inclusive for all of the different types of relationships that we can experience at this point, the more appropriate thing is to call this intimate partner violence. We've moved away from domestic violence because that really, it causes people to think about um, marriage and, and couples who are married. And just the reality is, is that it, not only do we have such a high divorce rate at this point, but a lot of people are choosing to not get married because they're realizing that's a better fit for them. Right. Intimate partner violence can happen in dating relationships. Mm-hmm. It can happen in so many different ways. Yeah. So intimate partner violence is the appropriate term at this point. We're mm-hmm. moved away from domestic violence. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll refer to it as intimate partner violence. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, go ahead and share with us some of the stats that sure. are out there. So intimate partner violence occurs in about 34% of cases where people are seeking medical care. So folks who report these incidents, like I said, 34% end up seeking medical care for it. About one in four women are victims of intimate partner violence and about one in nine men will experience this as well. What's found is that men tend to grossly under-report because of how we view men versus women in these types of relationships. So my guess, just my own personal opinion, is that the numbers are probably higher for men, Mm -hmm. just as they're very high for women, but that we just, we don't have the real-time number information to validate it. And then roughly about 15% of all violent crimes are directly related to intimate partner violence. Okay. Wow. That's a pretty high number. It is. It is. Wow. 
Okay. Yeah. And when you say that 34% of people reporting IPV incidents receive medical care for injuries, what does that look like? It means they're going to the hospital. Okay. Yeah. They're going to the hospital. They're landing in the ER and being evaluated for bruises, broken bones, strangulation, sexual assault, lots of different, very serious things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let's say that they're in the hospital and a nurse or, you know, is asking questions. What happens when that situation, and I know it's different for every person that goes through it, but what does that usually look like? Can you speak to that? Like, what does that interview kind of look like? Yeah. So it begins with just a simple question of, do you feel safe at home? Okay. And if the person who is abusing the victim is right there, chances are the answer is going to be probably, well, of course I feel safe at home. Mm -hmm. Or if they give kind of a weird answer of how they were injured. So how did you get this black eye? And they say, oh, well, I fell into a cabinet. Chances are that's not really what's going on. So Mm -hmm. then the nurse or the doctor may excuse anybody else who's in the room so that they can be alone with whoever is actually being abused and say, okay, so now tell me what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if they do admit that something is going on, what happens next? Do they have an opportunity to bring in the police or... That certainly will be offered to them. Okay. So safety resources will be offered, okay. but they but legally they cannot be forced, right? right? Okay. Unless the person who's being abused falls into a protected population, so either uh, obviously a child or an elderly person. So if they're in a protected population, then the the hospital employees have an ob- obligation to act on that. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, it can't be forced, and they either want it or they don't. Right. Okay. Yes. And then in the state of Connecticut, are you a mandated reporter as well for child abuse or elder abuse? Child and elder abuse. Yes. yes. Okay. I yeah. just want I just yeah. want to make sure. So check with your state licensing boards and find out where you are if you're not sure because that's really important. The protected populations we have to report, you know, as mandated reporters. So I just wanted Absolutely. to bring that up just to kind of yep. cover that base. Okay. So Let's kind of move into the emotional and physical impacts related to IPV because, you know, the physical is going to be kind of obvious, you know, Mm -hmm. it's going to be something bruised, something broken, something scratched, you know, we're going to see that. And a lot of people, they just, they might ask a question and there's a good reason, you know, quote unquote, a good reason for it. I fell into a cabinet, like you said. So yeah, talk about the emotional impacts. Of course, the physical too, because I know that all kind of plays in. But Sure. So, but I, I think even before we do that, that mm-hmm. it's really important to understand how many different types of violence exist. Okay. So in my own case, it took, gosh, I was with my ex-husband for right around nine and a half years, and it took close to seven years to escalate to physical violence. Okay. So- in a lot of these cases, there is an incredibly slow escalation of abuse. Okay. And th- that's really, really important for clinicians to be aware of when they're working with a survivor, because this is, this is usually going to be something that has gone on for an incredibly long amount of time. So when we're thinking about the different kinds of violence, it's important to take into account emotional, mental, sexual, and then physical violence. Okay. And usually it happens in that order. So in my case, it started with the emotional violence of just like the verbal abuse of who do you think you are? You're not worth anything. Where do you think you'd be in life without me? Those kinds of statements, even if he didn't say like verbatim those things to me, Mm -hmm. it always had that kind of tone Mm -hmm. of just really kind of keeping me under his thumb. After a few years, that went on for a few years. So after after that, it started to escalate to gaslighting. And if folks aren't familiar with the term gaslighting, it actually comes from a play that was written, I want to say, somewhere in the 1920s. And the whole premise of the play is that the it's a husband and wife. The husband is abusing the wife and moves like back, back then, we, they still had gas lamps. So he would move the gas lamp around their house Mm -hmm. saying that she had done it to the point where she actually started to believe that she was the one who was doing it and didn't remember. So the term gaslight comes from that play based on that specific moment where she thinks she's moving the gaslight Mm -hmm. and is losing her mind. 
Right. So, and she ultimately ends up going insane in, mm-hmm. in that play. So that's where the term gaslighting actually comes from. And it's literally a process of mental abuse that the abuser goes through with the abusee to make them think that they are losing their mind. So in my case, what that looked like was first that he would tell me that he changed his schedule after it had already happened when he really had never changed. He had never informed me of anything. Then he would go out with friends, had had never told me. And later on, when I would question him about it, he would say, well, but I told you, don't you remember? You have a terrible memory. And so all of these things kind of laid the foundation for me to really start to second guess myself and think, okay, well, maybe I do just have that bad of a memory. Maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe he did tell me and I just, I can't recall. And then it moved on to where he started actually moving objects around the house, telling me that I had done it and that I couldn't, I, again, Kelly, you have such a terrible memory. You can't remember anything. It had gotten to the point where just prior to getting pregnant with my daughter in 2012, I actually believed that I was having an early onset of dementia. And I was 30 years old at the time, or 20, 29, 30, mm-hmm. thereabouts. So I truly thought that I was beginning to lose my mind. Yeah. And, you know, I would just make it however long I could make it. And then that was going to be my life. Through the process of all of this, I had grown very anxious and very depressed. But this is where we start with the whole, okay, well, first I didn't know any better. And then when I did know better, I chose to stay anyway. It's saying to myself, you know, this is what I signed up for. You say yes once, and I just have to deal with it. I have to figure it out. I made my bed. This is what it's, it's going to look like for me to lie in it. Right. While the process of gaslighting was progressively escalating more and more, then it, it evolved into sexual abuse, mm. you know, and there's, there's some things within that that I still don't discuss to this day, just because it's so intimate, but there, there was a lot. Mm-hmm. He would come up behind me and grope my chest and grab my crotch in ways that I never consented to. And every single time that he did that, I would say to him, mm. I'm not comfortable with this. I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. I want you to stop. Mm-hmm. I feel objectified when you do this. Mm-hmm. It, fe- it, doesn't, it doesn't feel good. Right. And each time I would tell him, I'm not consenting to this, as you're doing this against my will, he would laugh at me and say, well, but you're my wife. I can do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. So, you know, right there, there's such, there's such an example of this is how much men and women who abuse their partners can look at them really as, well, but you're my property. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was only in the last six months of our relationship that he escalated to physical violence. Mm -hmm. So again, we were together for nine and a half years and it was only the last six months where there was a threat to my physical safety. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to throw in there, he never hit me, Mm -hmm. you know? And so when people hear about intimate partner violence, one of the first places that their heads go to is, well, she or he is getting hit. They're mm-hmm. getting physically abused. And that wasn't, aside from the sexual abuse, that was not the case for me. Mm-hmm. What ended up happening with the physical violence with it was that there were three separate incidents of him threatening me with a kitchen knife. In the final incident, he was in just a flat out rage for like two to two and a half hours and had pulled a butcher knife out of like the the standard kitchen knife box that everybody's got. Mm -hmm. And he walked around the house with that knife for the entire duration of the event. And in the very beginning of the event, he, when he first pulled the, the knife out of the knife block, at first he threatened to commit suicide in front of me. And then in the space of not even a nanosecond, he flipped it around and said, no, I should just slit your throat instead then I'd be out of my misery with having to be married to you. So I was petrified, right? Like I I truly thought that was the night that I was going to die. At the end of the incident, he had put the knife away and then threw punches next to my, next to my head, just in the air and said, you deserve to be beaten. I should just hit you. So there's a real threat of physical violence here in this, in this scenario or in this event. And 
yet I was never hit. So I want to emphasize to everybody who's listening, just because somebody is not being hit Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they're not being abused. Right. Okay. Okay. That's really important. I'm glad that you explained all of that. And thank you for giving us your history and your background as you were, as you were explaining, because it really does help kind of, you know, me over here listening and be able to picture a client or patient sitting in front of me, hearing their story. It it makes sense. It it, it definitely makes sense. Okay. And I know you mentioned that there are some other physical impacts besides the the actual bruises and cuts. I mean, there's other mm-hmm. things going on physically that we won't see. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about those? Absolutely. So for women, especially re- reproductive health has been really linked to IPV. Mm-hmm. So women who are experiencing repeated miscarriages, who have a stillbirth, intrauterine hemorrhage, mm-hmm. nutritional deficiencies, abdominal pain, GI issues, you know, and the list just kind of goes on that when somebody is being abused, whether it's small isolated events that are happening really, really spaced out, or whether it's repeated daily abuse is irrelevant. What matters is that it's happening and that there's a physical effect being manifested from a mental or emotional space. Okay. Good to know. Um, I know you put on here that victims of domestic violence are also at higher risk for developing addictions. Yeah. So people want to numb it away, yeah. right? Like mm-hmm. it took me, so I'm, I'm about five and a half years out from my divorce and I'm in a place now in my life where I'm physically very safe. Mm-hmm. So, and I've done a ton of work around my story, the experiences that I've had and being able to really feel like I can talk about it in a way that isn't re-traumatizing. But for so many people, they don't have access to appropriate care. They don't have the kind of support system that I'm very privileged to have. And they're doing a lot of this on their own, like really very isolated. Mm -hmm. And so they go to drugs or alcohol instead to be able to cope with the significant psychiatric impact that being abused has. Right. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's really good to know as well. Okay. Let's shift a little bit and talk about the therapeutic role. So as therapists, what, what would you like us to know first and foremost about working with IPV? Yeah. So in working with this type of client or this client who's gone, who's had these experiences, obviously the very first step is let's just establish safety. Let's make sure that, that whoever the client is, that they're in an environment where they are physically safe, right? Because we, we need to establish that physical safety first. And then we need to make sure that they have the correct supports set, it, set up or put into place if they don't have it through their, their family of origin or close friends, that they you know, are financially independent, they have a safe place to live, if they have children involved, that the children are safe. Like for me, my daughter was about a year and a half, and I fled in the middle of the night to a family member's home. Mm. I literally did the, the laundry baskets into suitcases. My oldest sister had come to get me, and I hid at her house for three days. If I didn't have access to family, I would have ended up in a a shelter Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with my child. So we need to establish physical safety, financial independence, you know, make helping them get a job if they don't have access to to employment, because sometimes that's something that an abuser can cut them off from, Mm -hmm. you know, and then making sure that they've got the supports in place to start putting the pieces back together emotionally and mentally. So absolutely paramount is safety first. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, once, once all of that has been done, and that's, that's usually in that crisis moment of, okay, they're ready to go. We have to go right now, right? right? Mm-hmm. Then we start working on, okay, well, now how do we put the person back together? Mm-hmm. And the very first thing that needs to happen is just allow them space to tell their story when they're ready on their terms. You know, there were things that took me quite a long time in my own process of therapy to even be willing to talk about. Yeah. And in public forums, I don't talk about them, but with family and friends, I do. But that took me 
two to three years to get to the point of being willing to even say out loud. Right. So as providers, just being able to lead with extreme patience of just they'll get there when they're there. Right. And the more that we can just hold space for them to let them know, I am safe for you to tell me whatever you want, Mm -hmm. whenever you want, in whatever order you want. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. One of the reasons why that's so important to lead with is how much survivors are dismissed. So an example of this, in the process of my divorce, I had disclosed the sexual trauma to my attorney. Mm -hmm. And while I absolutely felt that my attorney believed me, my attorney had said to me, don't disclose this in court because nobody else is going to believe you. Mm -hmm. It's not going to help your case. It doesn't matter. Right. And not that it, and she never made me feel like it didn't matter from an emotional perspective. It was from a legal perspective. She said, this, this isn't going to make a difference. Was that what, was that because it wasn't documented? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in my case, I had never gone to the hospital for any sort of abuse because he never left marks on me. I gotcha. So there was never anything that a hospital would have been able to do about this. I gotcha. And if I had called the police, like in the middle of one of our huge blowout arguments, we both would have ended up being arrested because without me having any marks on me, the police have no concrete proof of who's actually doing what. It's it's his word against hers. Right. Right. So, so that's something else for, for clinicians also to be aware of that, you know, a survivor may have been arrested mm-hmm. in the process of, of trying to leave if they don't have marks on them because the cops don't know who really what's going on. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I was told by my attorney in the process of my divorce, don't disclose this because nobody's going to believe you. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, a, a survivor may come into a therapeutic setting really saying or, or believing, well, what's the point in me talking about it if nobody's going to take me seriously? Right. What's the point in me saying this out loud if it's just going to be dismissed like it always has been? Hmm. Right. So we just need to lead with being able to hold space and say, I believe you. Right. No matter what, I believe you. Right. Okay. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Really, really helpful. Then once they start, or they they're ready to to share, and I know therapists come from lots of different backgrounds and trainings and theories. And what do you what have you found to be the most helpful type of you know system or model that framework that you work out of when it comes to helping IPV? Sure. So I practice primarily CBT and DBT in, in my practice. Mm-hmm. I have found CBT to be the most effective in just helping them name what it is that they're feeling. Okay. And then switching over to DBT in terms of being able to manage what they're feeling as they're feeling it. The things that I love the most about these two models is that simple is better. Mm-hmm. you know and being able to lead with that and that's that's really what ipv survivors need yeah. because everything feels hard everything feels complicated so if we can just lead with simplistic skill sets simplistic perspectives and just making things kind of it, into these bite-sized digestible therapy like mm-hmm. skills mm-hmm. it's just so much more helpful so the very first thing that I do skill-wise with them is just help them name their grief because that's so much of what recovery actually is. Yeah. And it's not just grief for the relationship. It's grief for the relationship, the fantasy of what they thought they were going to have when they first got with this person, whether it was first getting married or first starting to date. It's the grief of who they were mm-hmm. prior to being abused because your identity permanently forever shifts Mm -hmm. once you are a a survivor. It's the grief for who they thought their partner was so that they can work on accepting the reality of who their partner actually was. Mm -hmm. Right. So Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much grief to just be named Mm -hmm. and processed through. Mm -hmm. Is that something that is kind of a universal IPV framework, help them understand the grief what they're grieving. Would you say that's kind of a a universal? Truly, in my opinion, I think it is. I mean, Mm -hmm. in working with 
quite a few survivors at this point, both male and female. I find mm-hmm. that to be true across the board yeah. for, for all of my clients. Yeah, I don't know that every single clinician would agree with me that maybe there's other things that they do first that they find most effective in their practice. Mm-hmm. But this this is what I find most effective in my practice of yeah. just really helping them be able to name that grief first and foremost. Yeah. After after that, then I get into, okay, well now let's address your trauma too. Right. Yeah. No, I can imagine because I'm just kind of thinking about the sadness and the fear and the shame and the guilt that, you know, would present for somebody yeah. who is a survivor. And, you know, to me, that is, that would be signs that you're grieving the loss Absolutely. of dreams or goals or who you thought you were or, you know, so much. So I can, I can see how that would, those feelings would lead to unprocessed grief. For yeah. Sure. yeah. And I'm glad that you hit on the point of shame too, because mm-hmm. that's, that's another one that I, I truly, I think is like you put it a universal issue. Mm-hmm. You know, I, for, in my own experience, I was raised in a very devout Roman Catholic family. And even though I'm, I'm not religious at this point, you know, there's still values from that belief system that I carry forward. And I, so I was raised to believe that you say yes once, right? right? And that marriage takes work. It's Mm -hmm. not perfect. There are hard points and you work your way through it. And so that's the way that I approached my marriage of just really thinking, okay, what's my accountability in this? And how can I be the best spouse that I'm capable of being? Right. And in him beginning to threaten real serious violence. I had discussed it with my folks and they agreed with me. It's, it's time to go. This is a marriage that cannot continue. And it was incredibly difficult for me to work through my, my personal experience of shame Mm -hmm. in that I'm the third of four girls in my family and I'm the only one who's divorced. Mm -hmm. And I, even though rationally I knew that I was not a failure, I a thousand percent felt like a failure. So being able to pull apart that experience of what's the fact of a situation and how is that different from who I am? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's so true. And that's so important that you are able to to do that. The fact versus like your experiences. I mean, you have to, you have to draw the line in the sand. And I can, you know, I can relate in my religious upbringing. There's shame issues there for Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. that's, that's what they do. (laughs) Sometimes that's how they get us to fall in line, you know, and I (laughs) I say that jokingly, but it's kind of true. You know, there's, there is, I think some of that. So yeah. And then, you know, if you come from um, a family where divorce doesn't happen, you know, or we all have wonderful marriages, even though you're as a kid, you're looking at your parents and like, no, you don't, you don't have a great marriage, but the message (laughs) is, you know, so it's really important to understand the messages that we receive growing up and how they, we, you know, project them onto our lives. And when they don't fit anymore or they're, they're painful or they're violent, then we have to, we have to really look at that and, and decide what's, is this worth it? Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to emphasize in that too, my family never shamed me, you know? So a lot of, a lot of survivors will say, I feel so ashamed that I'm in this situation. How could I have let this happen to me? And what are people thinking of me? Mm -hmm. You know, even though I, I come from this religious background, my family was in full support of me leaving and being able to kind of hit that proverbial reset button on mm-hmm. my life. They, they saw how toxic the relationship was for years and I didn't want to listen, right. which goes right back to, I didn't know any better at first. And then when I did know better, I dismissed it. Yeah. So, but they saw it. So, it, you know, when, as soon as I got to the point of, I need to leave, mm-hmm. I, I need to get myself out of this they just wide open arms said, what do we need to do to help you? I was incredibly privileged to be able to have that kind of support system because like I said earlier, not all men and women do, Mm -hmm. but the shame that I experienced was 100% self-created and self-imposed. So as clinicians, that's another thing to be really aware of for all of us of just Sometimes survivors will experience shaming from from other people, mm-hmm. but a lot of times that's something that they're manufacturing all on their own right. and that they're putting on themselves. Right, right. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. And 
I'm nodding my head because I'm thinking of, you know, past clients and I'm like, yep, yep. That's, that's what was going on Yeah, for sure. And they, they have to hit a bottom, you know, mm-hmm. before they're ready to overcome that or to work through that. Yeah. So I'm just kind of, you know, my brain's going to different folks over the years that I've worked with. So I'm glad that I'm glad that we talked about that. And it's really yeah. important. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So let's, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk some about the cycle of violence. You know, when you're, when you're working with someone and maybe they come to you for the first time and they're telling you what's going on and you, you know, you're like, the flags are going off in your head and you're like, this mm-hmm. sounds like a, the cycle. How do you kind of bring that up to somebody who is really coming to you? They think for relationship issues, but what you're finding out is, oh, wow, this is, sounds like IPV here. What do you yeah. do next? Yeah. So first I just begin with psychoeducation, right? Like mm-hmm. before a client is willing to emotionally receive, you know, this is what I think is going on in your relationship they're going to be much more willing to just receive some black and white facts, Mm -hmm. right? Of just cold, hard, hey, here's this thing. I think you should be aware of it. Mm -hmm. So in beginning with psychoeducation, I just talked to them about there's this thing called the cycle of violence. You're talking about some things that I think could potentially fit into this. So I would just like to teach you about what the cycle of violence is first. And then if you're willing let's have a conversation about how that applies to your relationship. So, and usually we'll spend some t- gosh, in some cases, upwards of two to three sessions, just doing straight psychoeducation around what the cycle of violence actually is. Right. Right. So it's, it's pretty common to spend many sessions kind of processing the, the cycle. Okay. Yeah. Because I find that sometimes I I have to go through the cycle of violence multiple times and explain the same point Mm -hmm. about four or five different ways before you find that one way that the client is able to hear. Right. Right. Because they may hear it one way and say, oh, well, that's not me. That's, that's not happening in my relationship. You're Kelly, you're crazy. Right. 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 Uh, But then if you explain it with just a little bit of shift, that's when it might click for them and they go, oh man, wait a minute. Let me take Mm -hmm. a second look at this. Yeah. Can you talk about what the cycle looks like or the different phases? Yeah. So there's three phases. Mm -hmm. There's the the tension phase, right? Is usually where things start. And so this is the buildup to a violent event. And again, violent meaning this could be emotional, mental, sexual or physical. Mm -hmm. So there's the tension phase where maybe the, the abuser is getting a little bit snippy right? Like they're, they're speaking in a shorter tone of voice to the person on the receiving end of that abuse. The, the person who is abusive may have a shorter fuse, right? So not only is their tone of voice changing, but now their tolerance level or their degree of patience is significantly starting to reduce. Meanwhile, the person who's being abused will say, okay, well, let me just shut up and listen. Let me not talk back. Let me not have an opinion and I'll just do what they say because that's easier. Mm. They might lead with food and say, or, or lead with sex and say that this, this will kind of satisfy the situation and everything will be fine. So it's a lot of tension from the abuser and acquiescing from the person who's being abused. Okay. That then leads into the explosion, like so the, the actual event of violence. Mm-hmm. And that's, I mean, it's very simply put exactly what it sounds like. And again, it could be emotional, mental, sexual, or physical. They all count. And then as soon as that, the event is over, the abuser goes into a cycle of guilt and shame of, oh my God, I did it again, significantly like over apologizing. And the abusee is saying, okay, everything's fine. You know, it'll never happen again. He or she or they are saying they're, they're going to change their ways. They're going to go get therapy or help. We're good. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, so you're in this honeymoon phase for sometimes weeks, sometimes months. And then it, the tension starts to build all over again okay. until we get to a new, a new event of violence. Okay. Gotcha. So that's two phases or did you say the three? Third? Three. Well, three. Okay. So we have so tension. It's, Tension, Mm -hmm. the event, Mm -hmm. the event, and then then the honeymoon, the honeymoon. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. 
And so when you're in session and you're explaining this, do you ask them for examples? Can you think of a time when this may yeah. have been the case for you? Okay. So absolutely just trying to conceptualize how you use the cycle in a session. Yeah. And at times, you know, I, I think that obviously all of us have to be very careful with self-disclosure, mm-hmm. but w- only when it's appropriate, I'll mm-hmm. use my own experiences as an example, if the client isn't able to think of their own example, gotcha. or if they're, if I can tell their, their wheels are kind of turning and they've got something in mind, mm-hmm. they don't want to say it out loud. Mm. I'll tell them, you know what, in my own experience, this is something that I went through. Here's what it looked like for me. Have you ever experienced anything like this? You know, and it, I find that when I, I use self-disclosure that is really appropriate to what the conversation is mm-hmm. to let them know I've walked this road. Mm-hmm. Maybe you are too. All of a sudden they start to get a lot more comfortable with disclosing because now they know that I'm not just another therapist that they're going to say another thing to, to get dismissed, or I'm not just another therapist who isn't really going to get it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's, that's some feedback that I've, I've gotten from clients who are survivors, right. That they think nobody else is going to understand them. Right. So if I'm using my own experiences to say, Hey, I get it. Mm -hmm. I've been there. Right. This is, this is what I went through. What are you going through? Yeah. All of a sudden the floodgates open. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I like how you, you're able to self-disclose, but know when it's appropriate. I think that's really wise. Yeah. We need yeah. to, I, I'm a big fan, honestly, of using self-disclosure with, with all of my clients, but mm-hmm. I think we need to have really cautious and very clear boundaries around when we're willing to do that versus not. Yeah. And when it is and is not appropriate. Correct. Yes. I agree with you 100%. <laughs> and I'm kind of laughing and I laugh because I think about, you know, younger therapists and, you know, they want to self-disclose because they feel like it can be of help, but then it kind of goes and, you know, they're so new and they get kind of stuck and, you know, just thinking of things that I've witnessed over the years. So just, you yeah. know, if, if you are in this, po- working with this population and, um, you feel your self-disclosure, it could be appropriate and helpful. Just make sure you're talking with your supervisor and getting some really good supervision around what's going on in the room as the therapist and your desire to self-disclose in this room. And I know you mentioned in the beginning of the interview that you did your work and it really kind of made you take a look at your own stuff, you know, the the stuff Mm -hmm. that you had to unpack, I'm guessing in therapy after you decided to break the cycle and, and go. So I'm, I'm guessing maybe there's some common themes for some folks who are, you know, survivors. Can you speak Absolutely. to that a little bit? Yeah. So the, the biggest things that, that I've seen in my professional experiences and then in just personally also knowing other survivors at this mm-hmm. point is patterns of codependency mm-hmm. and meshed relationships, mm-hmm. low or no self-worth, mm-hmm. And really a, a significant lack of boundaries. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I imagine that those are, are some pretty common themes for sure. Yeah. It makes people into an easy target, honestly, mm-hmm. you know, and it's because, it, you know, it, let's take self-worth for an, as an example. Mm-hmm when somebody is really struggling with issues of self-worth, if they're constantly in this process of externalizing that and saying, Oh, well, if I, if this person says they love me, then I must be worthy. Mm -hmm. Or if this person says they want to be with me, then I must be good enough. And if I'm good enough, then I can just help them do this one thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's this constant externalization process of what worthiness actually is Mm -hmm. when as clinicians, we all know that that's not the way it works. Right. right. Like that has to begin internally. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I had that issue in my own, in my own life, in my experiences, because I grew up in that kind of environment where I was constantly externalizing. Well, if I did this one thing, then mom and dad were going to love me as the third of four kids. I was the incredibly typical or stereotypical middle child. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the two older got the attention that they needed. And the younger one had her own set of needs. And I was just, I always felt like I was just kind of there to figure it out. Right. Right. 
And when I got attention, it was because of something that I had done. So, and there was my experience of self-worth. So of course I grew up as an, into becoming an adult with that exact process, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Of course I grew up with codependent patterns because I externalized my experience of self, of self worth, mm-hmm. right. right? So then, of course, there's no boundaries because I was codependent with everybody, right? Right. So one leads into the next, which leads into the next, and so on and so forth. So we just we need to make sure that as we identify these things in our clients, that we're then taking the time to unpack each one separately, but then show the clients how they all link together as well. Yeah. Yeah. You just did such a nice job of explaining <laughs> those, you know, those traits or those habits or, you know, whatever you want to classify them as. So I guess my brain is going to, because you and I are both moms, we both have mm-hmm. daughters and, you know, now that you know what you know, yeah. well, how are you raising your daughter? Like, how do you model healthy boundaries? How do you model having, you know, positive and, you know, increasing your confidence and self-worth after you've been through what you've been through? Like, how do you show up differently? Yeah. So I, I will actually use the word boundaries with, with my daughter. So Mm -hmm. she'll, she'll be seven actually this week. Yeah. Happy birthday. Um, (laughs) So I actually use the word boundaries with her and I tell her, you know, a boundary is something that you know you need a boundary when somebody's making you feel uncomfortable or okay. when you feel weird about something. And does that capture 100% of what a boundary is? No, not really. But that's an age-appropriate, bite-sized enough piece of information for her that she can process it. Mm-hmm. And then she'll actually use that term with me when she'll say, mommy, you're stepping on one of my boundaries, <laughs> right? So I know it's getting through at least in some respect. And then as she gets older and she can process more, I'll evolve the the concept more for her. Mm -hmm. But that's not something I was ever taught when I was growing up. So it's incredibly important to me now to make sure that she knows that and that at least in my relationship with her, Mm -hmm. that I am constantly making sure that I'm respecting her boundaries. So like if we're snuggling on the couch and I go to tickle her and she says, mommy, stop immediately, Mm -hmm. I hands off and I stop Mm -hmm. because that's her setting a boundary. And I want her to know I'm going to respect when you say no. Right. Right. So not only is she able to set a boundary and have that be respected, but then she's also learning that she's the one that gets to control her body. Mm -hmm. So that then leads into some of the, the sexual aspects of what I experienced of that you know, I said no, and it wasn't respected. Mm. It wasn't received or heard. Or when it was heard, it it was dismissed. Right. So I'm constantly working with her on your body is yours to control and yours alone. Yeah. You know, I don't pick out her clothes in the morning. She does that herself, mm-hmm. right? So that she she has that kind of autonomy. If I tickle her and she says, mommy, stop, immediately I'm stopping she's learning how like all the age appropriate normal personal hygiene stuff for a 7 year old that's on her right you know all of these things become so important yeah yeah that's so wise i just love how you how you shared that 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 just makes so much sense you know and you're right i don't think i was raised with that kind of stuff either gosh how did we survive yeah <laughs> <laughs> how did we boundaries what's that you know what does that mean? Oh, it's so funny when, yeah. when you start to think about like how, how, well, I think about how I was raised and how I turned out and like what I'm teaching my girls. And mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but you know, as a therapist, I feel like sometimes I'm just, I'm almost like paralyzed in saying something or doing something. Cause I'm like, I don't want to screw them up. I don't want to screw yeah. them up. <laughs> <laughs> Chances are I'm going to screw them up anyway, but right. therapy, cause it's awesome. I love therapy. We should all go. Yes. To <laughs> yeah. I know we, we just do the best that we can with what we have. And absolutely. That's the other thing too. You know, I think that in terms of raising kids, we also have to think about discipline. Mm -hmm. One of the points that I make to her is that I will always love you. Mm -hmm. I don't always have to love your behavior or your choices. Right. Right. And really, so, because that, again, that's something that wasn't emphasized to me when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And that, that became a huge part of this whole issue of self-worth codependency, lack of boundaries and so on in my marriage. So, you know, I I truly hope and believe that if I'm able to teach her now Mm -hmm. what it is to separate her identity 
from her behaviors, that that's, that's something that we can hopefully avoid later on in life. Yeah. I really like how you say that. That's really wise. Really, really wise. That's, you know, I I guess I'm (laughs) thinking about my own parenting. I'm like, I guess that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I know that's what I'm doing. (laughs) I had a discussion in the car on the way to school this morning with my daughter and I was trying to explain projection to her, (laughs) but she's, you know, she's 11 and I was like, does that make sense? So today we're at your school, just pay attention to your thoughts. And when you get upset with blah, 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 just just think about what's going on with me. And she's like, okay, mom, have a great day. (laughs) Right. Oh, we can't help ourselves. Yeah. But, but you know, it, it, it's like you said, it's like, well, I just ch- keep trying to explain the concept, find a different way to explain it and let her know that it's okay to have these feelings. It's okay to be bugged. Absolutely. It's okay to feel annoyed, but take responsibility for why do you feel that way? You know, and yeah. don't just, you know, put it on other people all the time. So I think, I think that, like you said, age appropriateness is, is everything, but I love how you just keep sharing the same concept and she'll get it. We just got to keep repeating it, you know, because yeah. I didn't get it the one time I heard it. Right. I have to hear it from different, different voices too sometimes. So I know that you are doing incredible work, not just with your daughter, of course, but <laughs> like with your clients and um, they're so lucky to have you. So thank you so thank much you. for, for coming on today. Can I ask you one kind of personal question? Cause I'm just sure. kind of curious, your daughter, did she, does she remember any of the the stuff nope. that you went through and does she see her dad? She does. So, uh-huh. so he and I, because nothing was ever documented with the, with the police or with hospital services or anything mm-hmm. like that, he and I actually share 50, 50 physical custody. Okay. It, it obviously laws are going to be, really vary from state to state in Connecticut. We're a no fault state. Mm-hmm. So at the way that it ended up working, he actually admitted to everything that he did in court. minus the sexual piece that really didn't get brought up at all again, because my attorney told me not to, but when he admitted to the threats of violence in that very final incident, the judge awarded me primary residence and then awarded us 50, 50 physical custody. So we have joint decision-making power and all of that, but she lives with me Mm -hmm. and we rotate weekends. And Mm -hmm. then he's actually at my house with her two days a week. So a lot of people get really wide eyed when I say stuff like that, that, that he's actually in my home twice a week with her. There's no threat to physical violence anymore. And the boundaries are rock solid and crystal clear along with, if you do X, Y, or Z thing, here's what you can expect from me as the mom Mm -hmm. in terms of consequence. Right. Yeah. So, so he's very clear on all of that at this point and our, in the work that he and I have both done on ourselves over the last five years, we actually have quite a good co-parenting relationship. That is not the norm. Yeah, right. Uh, so, and I, I want to say that really clearly. Mm-hmm. Most people will do something called parallel parenting, where you're making the big kind of life-altering decisions together, but then what happens under each of your roofs, yeah. you're totally separate on. Right. True co-parenting is when you're making day-to-day decisions together. Right. So he and I are doing that at this point, and that is the exception. It is not the rule. Wow. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what I'm, I'm sitting here over here going, wow, good for him for doing his work because you don't hear about that a lot. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the the divorce and the way that it all happened, especially with me leaving without discussing with anything with him first, like I, I truly fled. Yeah. I, I think that, I, I like to think mm-hmm. that that was a huge reality check to him Yeah, because I, I took our daughter, yeah. right? He didn't know where his child was for three days. Wow. And then I had a protective order, right? It was, and it was a full no contact order protecting me and protecting her. Right. right. So, you know, if I put myself in his shoes as a parent, I would be beside myself. Yeah. Like you would have to lock me up. Right. To get me to, to be able to process that. So I can feel a lot of compassion for him while still wanting to hold him accountable to the consequences of his choices. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I wasn't, ex- I honestly was not expecting that to be yeah. your response. <laughs> so, wow. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm like speechless. That's just, it's really, that's great. Great for your daughter and great for him, you know, yeah. and for you that, I'm not saying it's it's all worked out, but it's definitely in a place where you both seem, you definitely seem to be in a good place with it. So that's yeah, I mean, I, I would never say that it's all worked out for right. sure. Mm-hmm. 
there will always be at least some degree of issues, but it, obviously we're like, we're divorced for a reason. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. But I, you know, the, the guiding question that I always ask myself when, when I'm coming up against an issue with him is what's in the best interest of my daughter. Yeah. Because oh. that, that takes my emotions out of it and makes it about her, mm-hmm. which helps me be able to think about it in a much clearer way. Yeah. So. And that's a very mature, very mature and evolved, I would probably guess, mindset because, you know, you've done your work. It's very obvious. And I yeah. think that's just incredible. So um, is there anything else that you, we need to know before we end our conversation about IPV? Yeah, I think the only other thing that I'd throw in there is just, you know, as clinicians, if we can hold space to allow our clients, like I said earlier, to process their grief, but to also process their fear Mm -hmm. about what's next, Mm -hmm. right? Of how am I going to make it work as a single parent if they have children involved? How am I going to manage my life without my partner? Because there's the codependency part that comes into play. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do to start over depending on the the impacts that the IPV has had on them and the degree of impact had on them? There's so much fear that can come into what if I can't do this? Right. Or what if I can't handle it? Or how do I even know what's next? So just being able to hold space for that fear and help them work through it one piece at a time Mm -hmm. really is so important. Okay. Well, that's been, this has been such an eye-opening conversation. Thank you so much for being here today. um, If, if folks want to learn more about you and your work, how do they, how do they find you? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Facebook is the Unapology Project. And on Instagram, I am unapologetically.authentic. Or you can come over to my website, which is www.theunapologyproject.com. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely put all of your links in the show notes and cool. and some resources as well, because I know that we we have some resources to share with listeners that they can find on, um, yes. on the show notes and in, on my website. So thank you so much for being here, Kelly. This has just been an incredible interview. Thank you. No problem. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Therapy Show with Lisa Mustard. I know there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and I'm thankful you've chosen to listen to mine. Be sure to visit lisamustard.com to access the show notes and discover more fantastic content. And I'd be grateful if you subscribe to the show. Thank you.